Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining today from wherever in the world you are joining from. We're really excited to convene this workshop and dialogue. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Maria Gould and I'm product director at Datasite. So my, my role today is in part to just give you all a very warm welcome and then pass off the mic to our very capable workshop conveners. Uh, and my role as well is, is to be here to, to listen and understand different types of, of questions and needs and, and use cases that all of you may bring to the table today that, that are useful uh, to, to keep in mind as, as we think about data site products and services and, and infrastructure and how we can better support all of your needs. So uh, as people are continuing to join, I'm just going to run through a, a very few brief slides to, to set the stage today. Uh, we are uh, just by way of housekeeping, just wanted to emphasize a few things. We want to make sure that all of you are, are here and able to enjoy this event in a productive and respectful way. So uh, to that end, we do have uh, a code of conduct that we follow at, at Datasite and that we enforce for all of our events, including um, events such as these. Uh, we are asking you to participate in, in different kinds of surveys, which Aaron will talk about to um, help us better understand the types of questions and, and information that is that are relevant to you as we think about these types of use cases. And we are um, recording this session, not the breakout discussions, um, which uh, will be distributed along with the slides afterwards. So I wanted to just say a few words before handing off to, to Ted and Aaron about, about why we're here today. So I wanted to just start, uh, for those of you who, who may not be familiar uh, with Datasite, just to say uh, a few words about, about what we do and why we're here. So Datasite is, is a global nonprofit organization. We're really driven uh, to support the research community around a common interest of, of making research outputs and resources and activities more openly available and connected to, to support reuse and discovery for the sake of advancing knowledge and, and insights across disciplines uh, and around the world. Uh, we're a nonprofit membership organization. Many of you here on the call today are data site members. It's great to see you here. And we really uh, work uh, together and, and collaboratively to, to support DOI registration for research outputs and resources, but a lot more than that as well. It's really about how can we, how can we advance and build upon the, the transactional nature of, of what we might think of as DOI registration to think about it in the bigger picture and to think about how we can how we can make all of these resources and insights uh, more open, more discoverable and more connectable. So it kind of brings me to, uh, to what we're doing with, with this session today. Uh, Datasite is a membership organization. We're also a community driven organization. And so, so we work uh, with our membership uh, organizations first and foremost, uh, to support their needs around registering DOIs, building workflows, enabling discovery and promoting reuse. But there's a wider uh, layer or many layers of, of community beyond that, uh, that are also involved in, in different types of activities and, and initiatives at, at Datasite. And that includes those who are building services and, and tools and, and platforms that integrate with, with data site metadata, various collaborators, uh, various policymakers looking at how to make research more, more open and, and more fair. And so those are all of the different levels and, and layers that, that we operate on as a community. And what we're really interested in, in doing as, as part of uh, this event today and, and similar ones is hearing from all of you uh, about 
uh, how you want to work um, best with specific types of, of research resources um, and what that means in terms of data site. So this, uh, this is the first uh, in, in a um, small set of community dialogues that we are convening generously funded by the Research Lounsbury Foundation to bring together uh, community members to, to talk about use cases uh, for building and supporting collaborative open infrastructure in specific types of domains and in specific uh, contexts. And so the focus for today, is, as you are aware, is on surfacing use cases for instruments and looking specifically at some at some domain specific uses for instruments. And this is really the kicking off point uh, or jumping off point to, to develop some ideas and recommendations for the community and also for DataSite uh, in that we're interested in understanding how can DataSite best support these use cases? How can we perhaps take some of these ideas and lead into some prototype development to work on collaboratively as a community to make everything that we are doing um, more effective and impactful. So, uh, so really, what we're what we're aiming to do today. This is not. Uh, there's going to be a combination of of presentations from from experts uh, in in the world uh, on some of these topics, uh, but we're also going to be turning it over to all of you to share your perspectives and your ideas to help inform this conversation. So I think that concludes my very brief welcome and introduction. And I will now pass off to Erin Robinson from Metadata Game Changers to tell you about the shape of today. Awesome, thanks so much, Maria. Um, and thank you all again for, for being here um, and for your willingness to talk about um, and have this dialogue around instruments. So I'm gonna put the agenda in the chat uh, one more time. Um, and I think it's really awesome to see so many of you here. So right now we have 42. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen briefly, but I'm mostly gonna orient you by page number of where I am. So, um, I'm in this Google Doc. And what we had asked for folks to do first as they're joining is to add your uh, name and affiliation and your connection to instruments if you wanna add that additional detail, but just to get a sense of, um, of who's in the room and what's going on. Um, and I wanted to give you a sense of the kind of people that registered. So when we looked at registration last, there were 73 people registered on Friday, which I think is a really, um, it was a much higher number than I expected, um, but we have a mix uh, of life science and astronomy and other. So the, um, the Richard Lounsbury Foundation was really interested in those two particular areas. Um, and then the other, I think, dimension that I wanted to bring up is that we have a really interesting mix, almost equally split between uh, data managers and data scientists, uh, librarians, researchers. Um, so there's a diversity of perspectives in the room. Um, which I think is really terrific and should lead to a rich, uh, rich conversation today. So that's a little bit about this pre-session questionnaire. Um, and then, as I mentioned, so we're gonna be actively in this note stock. So this is giving you a sense of the structure of what's coming next, but then there are places where there are these bullets and we love for you to um, dive in and answer these um, when we get to these silent Google docking questions um, or to the breakout. Uh, part of the, the workshop. So this will be a participatory dialogue. We intentionally named it that because we wanted there to be more, uh, more conversation than just a straight webinar. Um, and so I guess before we dive in, uh, what questions do folks have? Uh, any concerns? I'm gonna stop sharing. Awesome. Okay, well, I am gonna take advantage of the fact that we're running right on time and move into the, the landscape of instrument metadata. And our first speaker is Matt Marinick um, from UCAR and Matt is leading an RCN on uh, NSF Fair Facilities and Instruments. And Matt, if you wanna share your screen, you can take it away. And so these are gonna be short talks, about six minutes, seven minutes, and I'll uh, keep time and let you know. 
Can you hear me okay? Can hear you, yep. All right, my screen is shared now. You can see your slide. Not. Yep, great. looks Thank great. You. Well, thanks Aaron and Ted uh, and Jamaica for organizing this and uh, inviting me and uh, for our project to present here. As Aaron said, I'm the PI of a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation to uh, look at uh, persistent identifiers for facilities and instruments. And uh, this is a joint project between uh, myself, which is uh, at the National Science Foundation, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. That's uh, a long, long title, but um, we're based in Boulder, Colorado. And then we have colleagues uh, from the University of Colorado, Florida State University and Stanford University. And I believe I saw Andrew Johnson and Claudius Mundoma on the call today. So uh, we've got a couple of folks here on the call. And I also saw several uh, folks who attended some of our project workshops, which I'll discuss or are on our advisory group. So uh, great to see folks who've been involved in our project. Um, but this is a research coordination network project, which is, um, so it's a coordination grant. Uh, we're really trying to get communities together to talk about assignment of persistent identifiers to facilities and instrumentation. Uh, we've done a variety of activities. We just finished uh, our second year of a three-year grant. Um, we may have a fourth year due to a you know, cost extension, but um, we're, we're sort of getting into more of the latter stages of our project. Uh, we've done uh, a couple of focus groups in the early years, uh, quite a few pre presentations like this to many different groups. And then we had two um, intensive in-person workshops, which I'll discuss later uh, in these slides. But the goal of this project was and is to compile use cases for why and how PIDs might be assigned to facilities and instruments. So kind of the why question, you know, why are we, um, you know, in this, in this talk and in other um, sessions talking about this topic, um, and then you know, develop cross-cutting expertise and guidance uh, based on input from many different communities. And uh, we're just getting towards our recommendation stage of our project. So I'll say a few things about that, but really this is just kind of a project update. That's a bit of background. Uh, these are the kinds of identifiers and resources that we're talking about in our project, <clears throat> at least the starting point. Um, so uh, NCAR here in Boulder, we provide uh, facilities um, such as airplanes and radar systems and um, on the left there is integrated surface flux and some towers and various environmental measure, measure, measurement tools. Um, we've assigned DOIs through Datasite for um, about 25 resources of this type, uh, instrumentation or facilities. Uh, we've also assigned you know 10,000 or more uh, DOIs to data sets and other things. So we've been assigning DOIs for over 10 years using Datasite. Uh, and instrumentation has been one use case for that. Uh, on the right here, I see a picture of Claudius, our colleague, who's um, really spearheaded a lot of work in assigning a different type of identifier, which is the RRID, Research Resource Identifier. I think we'll hear more about that from Anita shortly. Uh, to facilities at a number of locations, including Florida State, Colorado, and now Stanford. And, and you can see those hopefully in the arrows there. And so the, the background of our project was we started talking about uh, this sort of shared interest and realized we were using different identifiers and had different purposes and, and we're kind of going about it in different ways. And so the RCN came together to, um, you know, let's talk about this more and get more people involved. So that's really where this came from. So I'm going to go through just a few details of some of the workshops and these have pointers to materials that you can get to more, more detail. Um, but uh, this has kind of been our, our, our you know, large scale project activity uh, that we've, we've uh, done the past couple of years. So the first workshop was here in Boulder, hosted by the University of Colorado. And in that one, we really dug into, you know, what are the primary use cases for persistent identifiers for instrumentation? Um, and I think we came out with about four, and probably I should have had them on the slide, but, you know, one is traceability, right? So tracing the use and um, impact of an instrument piece instrumentation. Uh, the second one is uh, reproducibility, right? So wanting to be able to read something and be able to then use the same instrumentation, the same resources, um, to you know, reproduce or rerun a given um, scientific project. Uh, the third one, which is uh, subtly different, but I think you know, um, related, which is provenance. So maybe not wanting to rerun something, but at least wanting more information on what happened uh, and, and some more precise information about instrumentation uh, that was associated with a project. And the fourth one is a kind of a discoverability and an equity of access use case, uh, which is using identifiers to make instrumentation and facilities more visible um, so that more people can know that they exist, and potentially more people can then um, know that, that they can be used. Um, so uh, traceability, reproducibility, provenance, and kind of usability slash equity. Uh, those are the four use cases I think that came up. 
Um, we talked about persistent identifier types. I'll say more about that next slide. So I'll skip that for now. But instrument granularity and evolution always comes up in, this, in these topics. You know, what is your instrument? What if it changes? What if you swap out and you know a, a microscope or a, you know a lens? Is it the same instrument? Uh, sometimes these are philosophical questions you can't really answer, but they always come up and you, you kind of have to deal with them pragmatically. And then very practical things that we talked about in terms of you know facility providers and users. What are the adoption um, and uh, uh, adoption incentives and challenges to assigning PIDs? What are the value statements and those kinds of things? So we have lots of presentation materials available on our website. Uh, we did release a, a report on this one, uh, which is available uh, from that link. And um, I just have the link at the bottom to our website. Uh, so this is um, a, a picture we put together, which hopefully is accurate, but uh, I think demonstrates some of the complexity that you sort of encounter in looking at this topic of the different identifier types. Uh, so the ones on the left are uh, assigned for many different things. Um, and the ones on the right are DOI-based systems um, for the most part, except for Crossref, you know, part of the data site bucket now. But um, I think this is something that, you know, people who are assigning PIDs may not really understand this ecosystem. Uh, and so the big, a big challenge is jumping in from the outside, you know, where do you start with this? Uh, so there's so many different identifier types. They're used for different things. Some of them are more straightforward than others. But this is a real ecosystem, and I think uh, this is a, um, a challenge for this community is to figure out how to make this not necessarily simpler, but more clear how it all fits together. That might be a good spot to pause or just like one, maybe one more minute or 30 more seconds, Matt, to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. So just to quickly mention, then we did our most recent workshop here. Um, we kind of built on that. And uh, one thing that came up is, is needing to connect what we talk about in these types of events to national uh, identifier strategies. Uh, some countries are farther along with this than others. But um, again, presentation materials are available for the second workshop and uh, we're happy to, to uh, have more people involved in our project going forward. I'll stop there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so if you have questions for Matt, if you wanna put them either in the doc or in the chat, I can grab them and add them to the doc too. Um, and Ted, do you wanna tee up Anita? You're muted. Okay, I know. Um, Anita Bandrowski from uh, SciCrunch, uh, the developer and um, and uh, evangelizer for RRIDs. Uh, Anita, go ahead. And Anita, we can't hear you quite yet. Okay. Yay. I'm unmuted. Yay. <laughs> Great. Right. Take it away. You'll have about six minutes. Okay. And I'll let Okay. You know I'm going to go really, time. really fast. So um, we started RIDs way back in 2014. Um, we started primarily around um, biological, key biological resources. And um, also there were a lot of software tools that were associated with various um, key biological resources that um, uh, we needed to um, uh, to track uh, throughout the literature. Um, <clears throat> so we have expanded with the you with the help of um, Annie Glarums and and Claudius uh, Madarma's group um, to uh, include organism or uh, to include I'm sorry uh, instruments. And in fact, um, that group primarily, and then um, uh, investigators themselves have included 2,376 instruments into the um, RID framework. 667 of those have at least one citation. Um, and the citation is really, really should have been in quotes um, because this is not a true citation in the um, DOI kind of sense. Um, it is certainly not in the... Um, uh, uh, in the references section, these are citations that look like this down here. This is in the methods section of the paper. Um, as an aside, we have 3,402 cores that have been registered. Um, 852 of those have now been cited uh, by at least one, uh, one paper. And um, these cores are coming, um, as Matthew mentioned, they started with uh, Colorado and with Stanford but these are coming like per university these days. Okay, what does an RRID look like? So here is one RRID 
Um, this is for the Illumina Nova Seek 6000 sequencing system. Um, there is the how to cite information, so you can actually copy um, this. You can always claim ownership if you are um, affiliated with this company or you are affiliated with that particular instrument. Um, there is a set of uh, relatively standardized metadata based on um, that particular uh, instrument. And then there's a bunch of uh, papers that are associated. So here you can see um, there's a paper, you know, the, le the most recent paper for this um, particular um, uh, NovaSeq platform was from uh, you at all. <clears throat> and here is the little snippet of information um, that uh, is from the paper itself that you had put together. And here's the next one from um, the next author and the next author. And one thing that you can see here is that these are verified by RRID. Reason that we put that little check mark in there is because this is what the author themselves had actually done. And so what we can do is um, we can actually use that um, information to improve our ability to text mine the literature. Um, <clears throat> which means that we can also get um, citations such as this, which um, maybe, uh, you know, are looking at a NovaSeq. Um, and of course we can always say that, no, this is the NovaSeq 500. Um, whereas this one, this paper that was brought by the, um, uh, by the bot has um, actually referenced the right thing. It's the NovaSeq 6000 series. So those can be um, voted on and added to um, as uh, reasonable references to that particular tool. There are several pipelines um, that we deploy. So one is the resource uh, disambiguous, uh, dis disambiguator for the web um, pipeline. This uh, takes all open access text mining accessible papers um, from PubMed Central. We are primarily biologically based. Um, and um, it uh, processes all of those for things like that NovaSeq uh, 6000. Um, we also have a set of students. Uh, these are undergraduates at UCSD who um, basically go through and trigger a little robot um, reader um, and then post that information into Hypothesis. All of that is made publicly available um, and uh, it is passed to Crossref um, via the Hypothesis um, portion of the pipeline. We are hoping that Crossref um, gets that information in, back into the database um, uh, where we had been submitting it um, called uh, event data. Um, the other part of the RID pipelines includes um, uh, basically, you know, investigators themselves adding their papers to the appropriate um, uh, RID. Okay. RRIDs play nice with the PID-INST schema. What is the PID-INST schema? I think you will hear about that. Um, this is a schema for instruments, and it is intended to um, more granularly define uh, instruments. Um, RRIDs are not for, um, you know, your pipetter. Um, they are absolutely for uh, off-the-shelf capital equipment. So this is talking about your um, MRI, again, not your pipetter, and not your particular instrument is not what we're interested in. We're interested in trying to find what is out there for, uh, for sale. RID staff, uh, including some of our students, are right now going through um, a very large effort to try and pull data sheets for each and every instrument to actually save that information. Because believe it or not, as big and shiny as this these instruments are, their data sheets go away very quickly um, as these companies cycle through them. So RIDs are not a granular solution for your particular instrument they are intended to talk about the class of instruments. How do they get in papers? Well, we're in a lot of journal uh, instructions to authors already. We're not in all of them, especially not in atmospheric sciences. Um, but we are um, prodded. We, uh, we, our inclusion of our IDs is prodded by journal um, instructions to authors and journal guidelines, as well as several checklists that I'll show you. So, so essentially... Anita, we have just about 30 seconds. Okay. Six we're minutes. In a goes bunch fast. Of papers, <laughs> including, I think probably we're most visible in the cell press uh, family of papers, where there's a large table of all of the inputs to a study, all of the research resources. 
Um, and this is really where um, we are strongest. Um, again, we're in various check uh, checklists and we know that we are making a difference. This is uh, the, abil the uh, ability to find a particular uh, research resource called an antibody. And um, that is very not findable in the scientific literature throughout this um, uh, 20 year period. But after we get started with the RRID initiative, you can see that this overall line um, of, the, uh, of the literature actually does improve in terms of its ability to, our ability to be able to find these key resources. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry for going 30 seconds over. Oh, you're great. Um, this was super, this was super, Anita. Thanks so much. Um, so Ted, do you want to introduce Dave, David, while we, David shares his screen? Yeah, so we started with uh, sort of a big picture of different, uh, sort of some options out there or, uh, or systems and tools people are developing for identifiers. We're going to have next uh, two examples of labs that are using identifiers. First, Dave Elbert from Johns Hopkins talking about, uh, uh, well, we'll see what Dave's talking about, uh, identifiers for instruments in material science lab at um, Johns Hopkins. All right. Oh, thanks, Ted. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everyone, for having me. We'll try to get rolling. Um, so as Ted mentioned, I work in material science. Um, there's a team of us really at Hopkins, also University of Illinois National Center for Supercomputer Apps. I put the gang down there on the right. There are many other students as well who've worked on this. And on the left, I quickly listed a bunch of different projects that I work on. The one I highlighted in orange at the lower left is the Materials Research Coordination Network, part of the Materials Research Data Alliance, and it's a Pharos RCN, which is really how I got to this and um, thinking about PIDs and interacting with uh, Matt and Claudius and Rain and Andrew and all. So uh, I'm gonna, oops, try not to click there too fast. I, I wanna say the driving motivator really for us in material science is how do we accelerate material science. PIDs are really great at linking in the background and serving other PIDs. That's kind of the magic to those of us who use PIDs but don't know a lot about PIDs. And we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we use these to really drive new, faster material science? Um, we're very interested in creating knowledge graphs related to our um, production of new materials, designing and discovering new materials. We're very interested in automation and uh, eventually autonomous labs. So my group has created a streaming package. What you're looking at is a picture of streaming from an electron microscope that's at Cornell University. We stream the data into our brokers and servers at Johns Hopkins where other parts of the uh, project is hosted. And so we're able to move data in an automated way, which gives us the capability to do a lot of things with that data on the fly. Here's an example of a different type of data. This is from laser shock testing a ballistic thing. So the movie that you're seeing on the left is actually, um, it's fairly small scale, just a few centimeters across, it'll play again. And at the top with a laser, we're firing a piece of foil that'll come out and uh, you'll see it fly down towards the bottom and it impacts something. So now we can see how strong a material is when it's under impact. And we get a couple of data streams out of that thing. We get um, uh, laser interferometry, which tells us, us the speed of the back of the surface that has been hit. So we can then calculate how hard it's been hit, the type of stresses. These things move at about eight to 10 times the sound of uh, uh, the speed of sound. So we're making shock waves through them that'll, that'll disturb it. So we need a really sensitive method. These high-speed images here are over just a few nanoseconds. So they're tens of thousands of frames per second. We stream the live video, we stream the interferometry. From it, we're able to take the headers of those files and extract metadata in an automated way that we can curate, but we also can process the data itself in the streams. On the lower right, you're seeing um, the interferometry trace. And with this big peak here, we're able to, in an automated way, get back information in effectively real time, not over nanoseconds, but before we can fire the next shot. But these shots used to happen about four to six a day. And now we're running these shots about in an automated way with robots running these things instead of graduate students. And we're working our way up to doing, instead of four or six shots a day, 10,000 shots a day. So being able to track this entire system is complicated. What you're looking at here is the robots taking a sample holder with a sample on it, 
handing it into a high energy x-ray machine. Uh, Rolf Kral is here, so I won't say it's a synchrotron in a box, but it's like as close to a synchrotron as you can get in a lab setting that's not a true synchrotron. We're gonna run around to the other side of the thing. And if you look on the screen, there's a little robot inside that took that sample from the other robot, puts it in the x-ray beam, takes about 30 seconds to run a couple of counts. We do both diffraction and fluorescence um, in these instruments. And then it'll hand the um, sample back out. It's a lot of fun to work with because everybody loves working with robots. Um, but uh, you'll see that it automates a lot of things. I don't have a lot of time to go through the lights you're seeing on top of this thing, but the x-rays are on, the shutter has to open. There are a lot of safety protocols. So there's a rather complex data system that's been created in this lab for managing, moving the samples along the conveyor belt, when the robot grabs the sample, how the robot scans a QR code and keeps track of what sample we're dealing with, linking that to systems of um, both metadata about that sample and actual data about that sample, about how the sample was made, what other characterizations have been done on that sample, and so on and so forth. We also are trying to link that together to automate our knowledge graph. So what you're looking at here is a graph of, uh, this is just a few thousand, but we have graphs that are as big as 50,000 now. Um, this is from a different project funded by the Army called um, HTM Deck, High Throughput Materials Designed for Extreme Conditions. And this is one of the centers at, at Texas uh, A&M University called Birdshot, run by uh, Ray Ariave and Ibrahim Karaman. Um, and so we have four different types of data objects, the process of what's happened to make this material, the material itself, using the material as an ingredient in another process, and then measurements that we take out of these things. And these are really fascinating to us because they allow us to take really complex lineages of how the materials are formed and then do some topological rearrangements and do things like, in this case, we're trying to make better alloys with certain properties. And so each sort of vertical track here is a different path through how that alloy was made. And then we can link out to summary data. But as you can imagine, along the way, we do a lot of things with instruments, which is why I'm really here to think about how that we how we can actually capture all that type of information and keep the simple stuff simple, like not have to redo it. So PIDs are beautiful for us anytime there is some setup that we can use it. The other thing we think about a lot are workflows. And so in our data portal, we stream all that data out of that characterization lab with the robots, and it comes into our data portal in an automated way and is curated into by types of data. Uh, within those, there are lots of different samples. Within those, we can link metadata. And if it's something like an SEM image, we can make uh, various types of um, uh, previews of the data. We have Jupyter notebooks that'll run here for people. We control data entry with simple JSON schemas that then turn in, that are version controlled, of course, and turn into entry forms for people. In some cases, they prefer to use um, spreadsheets, so we automatically populate the form as a stream processor for them. Uh, but the other thing that's really important oh, to us- Dave, yep. just about 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it. So we track things, is how we do this automation. And so we've been building a lot of automated workflows in Dagster. Um, that we run out of our portal. And so if you have, are not familiar with workflows, they'll run in an automated way on data as it arrives. And these different things are different computations and links between them. The graph is pretty simple to track. They fire up, they turn green, they manage everything for us. So we have automated ways to do it, but how do we do it? So we've made 11 lab instrument PIDs right now, but we have a hard time mapping what we want or understanding what we want to the way that PID inst works right now because we have mostly um, either bespoke made things or manufactured things. So that's kind of where we stand. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, David. That was really a very cool, very cool talk. Um, so next Robot. up we have Rolf Kral. Uh, Ted, you want to say anything else here or we'll just launch uh, I just say that Rolf is one of the uh, the pioneers of uh, persistent identifiers for instruments I, I think a founder of the pittance group where I met him and uh, and uh, a great implementer at Helmholtz Zentrum in Berlin so go take it away Rolf yeah hi Rolf, I'll give you the warning and, when you're at yeah. time and uh Many thanks for having me. I'm not the, the founder of the Pittens Working Group, but I was, uh, say, involved in it. Uh, I want to explain first of all a little bit about 
what HZB is. Uh, we are active in materials science and energy science. And we are, say, have instrument PIDs from two large scale facilities, a research reactor, BR2, which is not active anymore. It has been shut down in 2019. And uh, still active, the synchrotron light source PESI2 with 43 beam lines and 56 experiment stations. I counted that yesterday because it changed uh, all the time. And uh, we are user facilities. That means researchers from all over the world uh, can come to us, submit a proposal, and apply for beam time. Uh, yeah, OK. And I'm responsible at HZB for managing the data repository uh, and for, say, what is infrastructure and data management. Some particularities about our BESI2 instruments. Uh, they are custom built by ourselves. That means they are unique in the world and there's only one instance of that thing and has no external manufacturer or model. Uh, but they may contain off-the-shelf uh, components. Uh, and it always takes a combination of a beam line and an experimental station to conduct a measurement. And some of these experimental stations are fixed, they are attached to a beam lines, but some stations can be moved between beam lines. And that is the reason why we need to distinguish beam lines and experimental stations in the first place. If all the stations were attached to the beam line, then we would consider the whole thing as one single instrument. So um, how we do, do we, uh, what we do, do we do with persistence uh, identifiers for instruments? Uh, first of all, the motivation for that is mostly that we want to provide provenance information for the data that we collect. We want to say clearly mark this data set has been collected at that particular uh, uh, experimentation or at that particular instrument. Uh, and also the second uh, motivation would be we want to track the output of our instruments and see what uh, what which scientific products it created. So for the moment with PIDs, we are concentrating on beam lines and experimental stations and others instruments might follow on a case by case uh, basis. For implementing that, uh, we already had an instrument database in our user portal because the users need to, when they submit a proposal, they need to indicate which instrument they want to use and therefore they need some web page in order to, to find them and to, to understand them, which is makes things easier because we didn't need it to create a landing pages for those TRIs. And here is just one example from that uh, instrument database for one of those instruments. And I have here the instrument DOI and also that that links go to data site comments where you can uh, check out the metadata that is registered for that instrument. Um, as I said, the main interest is to link uh, the data sets collected at that instruments. And here you, you see uh, an example for a data publication that is made with us. And you see how that data set links uh, its, its instrument with um, data site uh, relation type is collected by that has been added in early this year. And yeah, that is already what I wanted to present. I'm very sorry that I don't have so nice uh, videos as they was. That is great, Rolf. Um, yeah, well, David, David has David has robots that make his videos, so we can't keep up. Yeah, we do also <laughs> have robots and it's messy. Next time I'll bring puppies. It'll be even better. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay, so last up in this um, 
lightning-ish round of talks is Ted Haberman um, from Metadata Game Changers. And Ted, I'll let you take it away. Great, thanks, Aaron. Are we seeing a slide? Yes. Does it look? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we started sort of bigger. We focused on a couple of facilities. Now I want to talk a little bit about how people and institutions are already using instruments and instrument metadata in uh, in data site. Um, we're we're taking advantage of the fact that in version four point five, the um, hang on, I'm trying to get rid of these things. Uh, um, the resource type general. Um, for instruments was was added to the metadata schema in version 4.5 so january of this year roughly uh 10 10 months ago and um the focus of the data site schema is pr primarily uh identification and citation so using resource type general it's a mandatory field uh before there were some pioneers that were using resource type which is a free text uh, resource type general is a, is a shared vocabulary, so it's just one word instrument. And uh, as Rolf just talked about, the the uh, the other important capability that we're interested in is connecting. Uh, he mentioned related identifiers and showed a couple of examples of is collected by and collects, which were also added to the schema in, in uh, January of 2024 as specific uh, uh, relation types for connecting data sets to instruments. And I think I think Rolf just showed us uh, one of the, the first examples of using those uh, those new uh, relation types. So um, what I'm uh, interested in is how we how we might use, how we might think about taking advantage of uh, the data site schema and uh, not only the mandatory fields, but other fields. So uh, there's sort of a spectrum that that occurred to me while I was taking a look at these uses of how how we describe uh, these instruments, uh, starting with the the most uh, the the most general uh, resource type general, and and maybe other uh, DOIs or uh, or other identifier types. And then getting more uh, detailed, the resource type is free text, so it gives you a little bit more uh, space to uh, provide information or descriptive information. And then the title of the instrument, um, uh, things that get searched for titles, obviously, uh, alternative titles. A lot of us use acronyms to describe instruments or to identify instruments. And then the uh, the heavy hitters, uh, technical info and abstract, which are two uh, description types in data site that that you know allow you to really uh, provide more uh, detailed information, either technical information or an abstract describing maybe the instrument and how it might be used. Um, we talked a little bit about connections. There are a number of related identifiers um, and uh, relation types that are useful. Described by has metadata are, are things that that point might point to other kinds of papers or uh, technical reports or other things other other things that are identified that are related. Um, instruments change, uh, so we can have it, different versions of an instrument. Uh, instruments and uh, uh, platforms and sensors sort of get put together in different ways. Has part uh, is part of. Uh, papers that reference uh, instruments, either references or cited by, and then collects and is collected by for connecting uh, instruments and data sets that I already mentioned. Um, a lot of different kinds of contributors can be used in, um, in data site metadata. The most common one that we're seeing in, uh, in instruments so far is hosting institution. So this identifies the institution where the instrument is and in, in uh, uh, HCB uh, case that Rolf described, those instruments are built and custom built there. Uh, we have a data collector who is a person or an organization that might use the instrument to collect the data. And we have sponsors, which are in-kind uh, in kind, uh, uh, supporters of instruments and experiments. So there's just a couple of ideas for contributors in the course. Funders are always important. 
uh, keeping track of who's funding things and what awards are funding things. Also, all of these. So this is just sort of a, a preliminary idea about things we might be able to take advantage of in the data site schema. And one of the, our goals for today and the ongoing discussion of this uh, group is to maybe extend some of these things or to describe how they're being used. So. Um, this is uh, in the current, currently I mentioned uh, there are 78 uh, instruments in uh, described in data sites so far with the uh, resource type uh, instrument, resource type general as instrument. Um, most of the metadata is uh, the various kinds of descriptions that I mentioned, uh, connections, uh, mostly how these things are put together. I'm, I'm excited to see you off with some examples of uh, the, the collected things and then uh, the contributors, the hosting uh, institutions. So this is sort of a a, uh, a profile of how uh, how data sites are being used, and then some examples uh, from HDB. Uh, Rolf talked about Bessie. Uh, this is what the my graph is not as uh, is easier to read than David's, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, it, it, in this case, it has identifiers for instruments and papers and um, organizations. And so this is the, the machine readable view uh, and the connections uh, between these items. Uh, so this is the most general uh, sort of what, or the least detailed. Uh, as we add resource types, we can see uh, the beam lines and experimental stations that were mentioned by Rolf are collections of different instruments that are being used um, in these different experiments and uh, and configurations. And then finally, uh, the titles everywhere uh, provide sort of the human readable uh, picture of the organization, Helmholtz syndrome in the middle, the different experiments and beam lines that they've used, and then papers uh, and uh, and funders um, that uh, that fund uh, this work. So uh, a uh, uh, a set of existing capabilities that we can use and, and build on in data site. And that is the last picture. Great job. It's just about to interrupt. Super. Um, well, let's first give a round of applause to all of our. Uh, lightning talk presenters. Presenters, we gave them a hard challenge of six minutes. Um, so first, uh, you can unmute our emoji. Um, it's got some clapping. Um, and then we are uh, at the top of page five. And I want to take just a minute to get folks to react in the doc um, before we open it up to discussion. But we have about um, 10 minutes or so um, to, to have a comment. So let's take just uh, 30 seconds um, to start reacting in the doc. Um, and Um, and we can keep going, uh, keep adding comments in the docs um, as we open this up. But I wonder from everything we heard, um, if somebody wants to kick us off. Maybe Rob, Casey, to put you on the spot with your question. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, I almost think that Ted may have sort of answered my question um, sort of in that la in those last slides. So thank you for making that association. The question is, uh, what is the relationship between a developed library of PIDs and growing a domain-focused but shareable knowledge graph? And as we know, knowledge graphs are really starting to uh, gain prominence in a lot of scientific realms because this seems to be a great way that we can um, um, <clears throat> uh, a, a, a base of vocabulary, you know, like a shared vocabulary for, for given sciences, but actually show the interconnections and the subtle relationships. Um, but I was hoping maybe you could speak to how we could relate the development of both of these. Um, 
I'm not, hey, Rob, good to see you. Um, I'm not sure I understand completely the question. If we have develop, uh, these PIDs, um, you know, Dave uh, can talk and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really just, uh, I, like some, I like some pictures, so I use it for, for making pictures. But I think doing the analytics is also going to be, you know, when we start doing more graph analytics on these things that we need to do uh, with the graphs of the, the size and complexity that Dave's showing, uh, I think that that's where a lot of interesting stuff is going to come out. So, so the relationship is usually, you know, software. Uh, I'm not sure I'm really understanding what what you mean by the relationship between a library of PIDs and and knowledge graphs. David, can I yeah, can I weigh in on that? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, so, um, so I think it's a, I think it's a, a great question. I'm, I'm sure that in a group like this, we use slightly different language for things like library of something and various things like that. I will say that from my perspective, a lot of the focus, when people say knowledge graph today, they usually mean, you know, an RDF type of presentation. And we're actually looking at in, in my work, focusing on knowledge that isn't naturally uh, captured that way. And so a knowledge graph should impart knowledge. Um, but I think that to me, the tricky part is that the PIDs, and, and here we're talking specifically about instrument PIDs, I like keeping the simple simple. So if I can get a bunch of stuff that I don't have to recreate when I generate these things, if I have a library of PIDs that I can link to, that's brilliant for me, right? And it works really well. The tricky part to me is that no matter how long we polish the schema for instruments, there are going to be things that aren't captured, right? What is this boundary between metadata and data? What's the right granularity? I have a thing that I put in the document. If you run a scanning electron microscope or a, a transmission electron microscope and you're taking images and then you turn two knobs and now you're taking diffraction patterns, it's as if you're on a different instrument. It's really fundamentally different data. It's data that you want to use together a lot of times. But so is that one PID for that instrument? And then modes, I think so, but I've been in lots of workshops that I've helped organize where people will argue about that no end. And I'm sure Rolf can give examples where you have a detector in a hutch at a, uh, you know, at a synchrotron and whether it's uh, one meter from where the sample is or it's two meters or 14 meters, you're doing a very different type of experiment. So it's sort of the same instrument, it's a configuration. And we get tangled in those things. And I think mm -hmm. we need to figure out how to get untangled. <laughs> and and it, I don't think there's a single answer. There doesn't have to be in it, but we need to find a way with the flexibility that we get the function, that we keep track of where we're going, which is why I think a meeting like this is great because there are people who know the details of how one actually makes a PID and keeps it keeps the P in PID. Yeah. Maybe uh, I didn't do that. Maybe I didn't do sure. that. Um, um, I would suggest that uh, how, how we are doing things. First of all, um, uh, it's important to, to understand everything in that area is work in progress. So we are in the process of developing things. In our community, uh, we do have uh, an or we de develop an ontology on experimental techniques. And therefore, my approach on that what on the problem that David David just say sketched would be, I would keep that PID for that instrument, regardless of its mode as it operates. Mm -hmm. But I would tuck the data sets as saying, okay, that da data set has collected this instrument using that technique. Um, Katarina, I see your hand. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think regarding the instrument and how uh, we keep track of its changes, um, it will have to be really something that is. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. Uh, we will have to be a decision that is done dif in different domains in, in s different ways. So I don't think we can. I think the way that we should approach it at the level of schemas and data, you know, data sites and stuff is to 
uh, make MPID in schema is about making sure that we offer the relationship. I mean, we provide a schema that that allows for different uh, ways of using it. I mean, what uh, Anita was saying is that in some cases, uh, for example, if for some of like what Matt uh, was saying about the different reasons to have the different uh, rationales for having a PID, for traceability, for like an institution to know what they have bought, I mean, it's definitely enough to have the category, so RRID, uh, but for reproducibility, often in microscopy at least, it is absolutely not enough. Because I mean, uh, essentially we already have people writing, this was an LSM 900. And the fact that they're adding a, an RID to this LSM 900 doesn't really change anything in terms of knowing what actually was done. So in that case, we need to be able to add the granularity of individual instrument and hardware descriptors that are actually based on community standards. So, um, but you know, the point is what, what we proposed in, uh, in, in this persistent hardware description project we put together uh, was that, you know, uh, you have a concatenation of essentially RRA of PIDs that, um, so that you have an RID that gives a class, a PID inst that gives the instance, and then you actually have a persistent identifier for the description so that you can concatenate the three IDs. And you know, not everybody will need to use all three. Uh, but for certain in for certain, but you have the ability of of tracing all these aspects in case you need it. Um, so I think, but you know, in, in in microscopy is what I know. Uh, but I'm sure there are other situations in which um, all you need is um, the class. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think so. I think the point is that um, we have to create the infrastructure for people to, in the different communities to come up with ways of solving their issues uh, using the infrastructure we put together. Awesome. Thanks, Katarina. Um, so I'm seeing there's a lot of there's a lot of great notes in the doc too. Um, and the next part we're gonna just continue to sort of deepen this dialogue and um, move into a set of breakouts. Um, and so I would encourage you to just, you know, be sort of cruising through this document. I love it when they get unwieldy. So I'm not I'm not worried about um, these rich notes. I think it's really wonderful. So we are moving into really the dialogue part of this dialogue um, where we're going to split into breakouts. Um, I'm watching people drop off as we as I say the word. Um, but I would encourage you to hang in if you're um, interested. And yes, I will put uh, maybe Jamaica if you could set the put the link in the chat. Um, so the, the breakouts are really a chance, one, for you to meet a smaller group of folks who are in the dialogue um, to have a real conversation. And there are two sort of questions that are in the, the breakout um, part of this document, and I'll share my screen here um, just to set this up. So we are looking for one, you know, what are example types of instruments or specific instruments, however you want to answer that question. And then the other thing that we're really curious about here are what are the use cases for instrument metadata? And if you feel stuck, you know, in the notes above, there are many examples that we heard in the um, in the presentations, like you know, just this one, you know, tracking instrument calibration dates, like how, like that might be a use case that we talk about. Um, and so um, we're looking for those kinds of activities. And then if, if you can phrase them in this uh, sort of strange language of how might we, how might we track um, instrument calibration dates, that is something that we can then take into the next phase of this project, which would be the kind of like, what are the requirements around it? But that's not what we're gonna get to today. So today we're really just wanting to be as generative as possible around all of these activities that we wanna do. Um, and so with that, I'm going to open up three breakout rooms that you'll be able to choose to go to. Um, so there's an astronomy, a life science, and an other. And if the other gets to be like most of the group is an other, 
then we'll shift the astronomy because I think that's going to be our smaller group um, into kind of a more other astronomy focused other. Um, so, um, and Deb, I see your, um, that are supporting. So I think if you're interested, this question from Deb is great. I'm interested in pits for computing resources that support all domains. So I think other, or, you know, a, you know, if you're interested in like other with the potential for an astronomy focus, um, that would be, that would be the, my suggestion there. Any questions before I open these rooms? So we'll have a couple of minutes to join um, and reshuffle as needed. And if you don't wanna be in the breakout, you can stay in the main room and just sit quietly and we'll be back in about 20 minutes. Um, and I will stop sharing. So any questions?